Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. Um, and thanks for inviting us to give us the occasion to present this to this big audience. So I see there's a lot of people, the room is almost full, so that's great. So I hope I don't uh, waste your time. Um, it's a technical lecture, so, so um, I think it helps to know a bit about crypto, but I will try to make it as uh, accessible as possible. So first, what I should say is that it's not only my work. So uh, all these things that I will talk about today is joint work with a lot of people. And I put the most important ones on the slide. So uh, first of all, the Ketchak team, uh, which is uh, uh, Gilles Van Asch, Michael Peters and Guido Bertoni, who were, uh, with who we designed Ketchak, and from which this uh, work evolved. Uh, some people that later joined is uh, Ronnie Van Keer, who's a colleague at ST Microelectronics at the time. He's a very good programmer, so he helped us to convince the community of the efficiency of these things. Um, Bart Menning, who is a colleague at Radboud, but I know him already for a long time, and he helps with provable security aspects. And Seth Hoffert, which is an American who, um, yeah, is like an amateur cryptographer, sir. and he sent us a mail, uh, and then we were interviewed by his mail, and we contacted him, and he had a lot of good, good ideas. So, so not really the scientist. He's just doing crypto after hours, and he works for a company that makes software for a bank. But his job is not a cryptographer, but he's really, really good. So uh, I also thank him. Okay. So um, I think in the announcement it said on permutation-based crypto, and this is on DAC functions, but there's actually two ways of looking at the same thing. But uh, I hope that will become clear during the presentation. Okay. So this is the outline. Let's just start. So uh, I think it's first important that I explain you what authenticated encryption is, because that's the, that the, the holy grail of uh, modern symmetric crypto is to do secure authenticated encryption. Um, and I have here uh, yeah, a block diagram. Uh, so let's say we have Alice and Bob, and they want to communicate in a way that um, the messages that she, they send to each other, or in this case, that Alice sends to Bob, that Bob, Bob uh, first of all, that an, an eavesdropper cannot see the content of the messages, and second, that when a message arrives at Bob, that it has been has, uh, not been modified underway. So if Bob receives a message that supposedly comes from Alice, from, it's also a message sent by Alice and not modified in between. So how does authenticate encryption work? Authenticate encryption takes as input uh, a plain text. Huh? So that's data to data encrypted. If you have, for instance, an IP package, that would be the payload. And possibly some associated data that is not encrypted, but that will be authenticated. Huh? Um, for instance, this could be uh, the IP address of the sender or the receiver. Things like that, because you cannot encrypt it because other because the message wouldn't arrive, right? But you want to authenticate it. So this is the the content of the plain text, and that is converted con into a cryptogram, where C is the ciphertext. Ciphertext consists of uh, encryption of the plain text, and a tag that is computed over both uh, associated data and plain text. Yeah? Um, then typically, um, when you have sending twice the same message, for instance, a short message, uh, OK, or something, as a response to a previous message, then uh, you will, this is a deterministic algorithm, so then you will actually have the same ciphertext. And to prevent that leakage, uh, we have here a diversifier. And that thing is supposedly unique per message. So for each message, you should make up a new diversifier. You can have, for instance, a count. Uh, for every message that increments by one. First message is one, second message is two, three, and so on and so on. But you could also have a sufficiently precise clock. Uh, that's also a way to do it. Okay, so I mentioned the main thing except this. That's a key. That's a secret key that Alice and Bob have to have agreed in advance. How the key gets there, uh, how the key gets here and here, that's out of scope of symmetric crypto. That's public key, public key, or key management, but we assume that the key is there. So that's, of course, a very hard problem uh, of uh, doing crypto, is getting the keys there, but that's out of scope of symmetric crypto design. We assume that's the case. Yeah? Okay, so uh, let's reiterate. So we have Alice. Alice wants us to send a message consisting of associated data and plain text to Bob. 
She first conver converts it to ciphertext and a tag, and then she sends this to Bob. So she sends the ciphertext, the tag, the and the associated data. So uh, if this is an IP package, she sends the header of the IP package, the encrypted uh, payload, and a tag computed over the encrypted payload and the header. When that arrives at Bob, uh, um, you have here, here uh, so Bob receives the same thing. And Bob has a decryption algorithm. Uh, so Alice has Alice encryption algorithm, Bob has a decryption algorithm. And this decryption algorithm also takes a diversifier. So this must also be communicated in some way, or it can be agreed. Huh? So if they both, if Alice sends a message, she increments the counter by one. And if Bob receives a message, he increments the counter by one. He also has the key. So this converts this thing into two possible outcomes, either the plain text or an error. An error is if the tag is incorrect. So the whole point is that uh, Eve, who can try and insert messages, she cannot produce a valid tag. That's the idea. Yeah? Uh, well, uh, uh, of course, here, a valid tag can be, can be. So that's authenticated encryption. And that's what we try to build using uh, DAC functions. And that was previously, well, up to now, still now, being done with block ciphers. So this is the explanation, but this just repeats what I just said. So it's, I will later uh, make the slides available that you can do, you can read and you're interested. Okay, so this is a simple thing where you have a single message uh, consisting of associated data and plain text and a single thing RAM consisting of uh, ciphertext and tag. In uh, many systems, what you're interested in is to authenticate a stream of data. Let's, uh, if you took a look at Signal or uh, WhatsApp, huh? you all the time send messages. And um, what we would like, at least that's what we think, is that a tag doesn't only authenticate the last messages, but the last message, but also all messages that came before. Yeah? And that can be realized with session authenticated encryption. So here we first initialize the device right, by loading a diversifier and a key. This thing must be unique per session. And then uh, a number of messages, in principle, can go on forever. Where each message consists of a header, uh, well, associated data and data text, and you convert it to a cipher text and a tag. And um, when uh, this tag doesn't authenticate the message, the AI PI, but AI authenticates AI minus one and PI minus one and so on up to A1, A1. So this protects against uh, an adversary that tries to remove messages from the flow or repeat messages. Yeah. Um, for the rest, it's the same. Uh, so how does this arise by keeping state, actually? So this is kind of a state, and the state is updated with each operation. That's the point. Yeah. Okay, so this is the required functionality. This is what we try to achieve. And um, now the rest of my presentation will be on explaining how we try to achieve that. Okay. So how do we, do people do this uh, making in, in the current way? So the way it's currently being done. Um, um, it's actually a two-layer approach. Huh? First, uh, we built something, a small encryption system that can encrypt fixed length blocks, typically a 64-bit block or 128-bit block. So it can actually convert 128-bit plain text into 128-bit cipher text under a secret key. And that thing is called a block cipher. So how many of you do know what a block cipher is? Oh, that's very good. How many of you don't know what a block cipher is? Maybe. So everybody knows what a block cipher is. Or at least nobody wants to admit that they don't know what a block cipher is. So that's very good because then I can assume that known. So the security goal of a block cipher is um, actually this is called PRP or SPRP security is that if we have the block cipher with loaded with an unknown and secret key eh, it should behave like a random permutation. So you have a kind of uh, distinguishing experiment where you have an adversary faced with either a block cipher with uh, a fixed and unknown key or a random permutation and he has to try to distinguish them. And uh, we try to build block ciphers that satisfy the security goal. 
Um, and what typically um, is done is done, try to estimate the distinguishing advantage. So that's kind of the probability of guessing that it is uh, correctly, whether it's a block cipher or a random permutation. And that's something that should be very, very small. Yeah? Um, and we can express it as kind of a, a mathematical formula, which is symbolized by this epsilon p, as a function of the resources of the adversary. And this M and N, these resources, it's typically two things. M is the data complexity. It's the number of queries you can make to the block cipher. So you have access to the block cipher or a random permutation, you don't know. And you can make a number of queries. And M is the number of queries. So you can say, encrypt me the all zero string. Encrypt me the one string. Encrypt me this string and string. And N is the computational complexity. That's the number of offline computations you can do. So if you have, for instance, a block cipher, block cipher, a yes, huh? um, you can actually do exhaustive search. You can try all possible keys and see that the query you asked, that it matches uh, a key tested. Okay, so, and this is supposed to be a very small advantage. So we can actually uh, not prove this. We can only make a claim. Yeah? So we, what we do is we build a block cipher that we think is hard to distinguish from a random and bit permutation. And we publish it and we make a claim. So we give an expression and we say, okay, so cryptanalysts, if you if an attack that breaks this claim, so that has a higher advantage than the one we claimed, then we consider it broken. But you cannot prove that. So that's basically the basis of symmetric crypto is that we trust the cryptographic community to do a good job. First of all, the designers to do a good job. And second, the, the, the attackers, the cryptanalysts, the academics that do a PhD in cryptanalysis, to, to break the cipher as hard as they can, but don't succeed. Yeah? So um, if they do succeed, you got a problem. Huh? So for instance, for DES, DES was, was broken. Previous time. AES is not broken yet. Are attacks where you could say it's broken, but that can be discussed. Anyway, these attacks have very high complexity. So they only become successful if n gets close to 2 to the power 128. So a high, very high amount of computation. Okay. And as and years go by and there are no attacks, we can take this advantage more and more seriously. Yeah? In the beginning, there is no value. A new cipher with a new new. Yeah. Says who? Huh? So some designers. But if over the years Shamir tries to attack, with, or those people try to attack, and they don't succeed, you get um, more and more assurance, and that's what that's the basis of security. Uh, what you typically do when you design this thing is you try to break it yourself, and then um, you uh, add some number of rounds. So for instance, when we did AES, huh, we could break six rounds. So the best attacks that uh, Breaking AES could break AES up to six rounds. So then we gave it 10 rounds. Assuming that uh, over the years, this get so much better. And they did get better. They got to seven, seven uh, rather quickly. And they're still at seven rounds. So I think we kind of uh, made a good estimation. So we still have 30% safety margin in AES. Okay, so that's a block cipher. But this thing only can encrypt messages of fixed length. But what we want to be, want to do, is we want to encrypt messages of variable length. And we also want the tag. So to do that, we can build and build actually a mode. A mode, a, a way of using a random permutation, assuming this is a random permutation. A way of converting that into something that does what I explained in the previous slide. And we can often, uh, prove an upper bound of the probability of breaking this mode, so breaking the security of this thing, thing, we can prove it, assuming it's a random permutation, again with an expression like that. So we can say, okay, if, we, if this effort, then um, the probability that it's broken is that. Yeah? And this can be proven. This cannot be proven, but this can be proven. And then we actually substitute in this mode the random permutation by a block cipher. We put a block cipher in place. And then it's simple uh, probability theory that the breaking probability is the sum of these two expressions. So the first expression that can be proven, 
second expression that is just based on public scrutiny. Yeah? And if both are small, then we have a secure mode. Not provably secure, because as soon as you have a concrete block cipher, let's say you, you plug in AES, it's not provably secure because this cannot be proven, but we have some guarantee based on assurance. Yeah? So that's the way to do crypto. And this worked fine. Um, well, worked fine. There are a number of problems, but this approach is the only we have, and it kind of works fine. Okay. So, um, but there are a number of challenges in block cipher based crypto. The first is that actually a mode that takes a random permutation and does variable length messages and computes a tag is quickly becomes quite complicated. And um, these proofs uh, that I mentioned on the previous slide, so this proof um, is not so easy to do. So we saw uh, some examples of proofs that failed in the last few years. So for instance, there is a very popular mode OCB that's very efficient. And it had also a proof of security. And there was nothing wrong with the proof, but with the modes that standardize OCB2 as a version of OCB, um, this does not satisfy the condition, conditions that uh, OCB in the proof had to satisfy. So there were some formal conditions that were not satisfied, and this led to a break. This went unnoticed for 10 years. So the proof was already published 10 years ago, and OCB2 also. And only then it was found. So that was because this, this, uh, these proofs and the conditions are quite subtle. Another example is a more recent proof called GCM SIV, a mode GCM SIV, where uh, the proof turned out to be wrong. And well, the authors, they called it typos, but they were just simply overstating the security. So, so uh, the first thing is not so easy to prove because these modes are quite complicated and um, uh, hard to verify the proofs. That's the problem. Probably the proof is typically 10 or 20 pages and uh, reviewers, they uh, review a paper for a conference. They try to verify the proof, but they don't have the time. And they say, yeah, it looks okay. Yeah, but that's not a way to, to get assurance of fraud. A second thing is that in, uh, in ciphers, there is a certain bound um, that if reached, the security collapses of a mode more. And the security collapses if M, so the number of faults to the block cipher you can make as an adversary, if it approaches 2 to the power N over 2 blocks. And this N is the block length. So uh, the old standard DES had a block length of uh, 64 bits. So in that case, this 2 to the power N over 2 is 2 to the power 32. 2 to the power 32 blocks. One block is eight bytes, so two to the power um, 35 bytes, that's uh, 32 gigabytes of bytes. That's not so shockingly big. I think nowadays you got uh, USB sticks. Uh, you can buy a USB stick for five euro for, uh, or I don't know, here in uh, Czech Republic, what it would cost, but uh, with 35, 32 gigabytes. So as soon as you encrypt more than more the amount of data with this, or triple death, an improved version of death, uh, you get in trouble. Yeah. Um, and you can read about it in this, in, this, uh, in this attack that was published, I think, at some high profile conference. Okay, so it's really a big problem for modern cryptography because modern ciphers, they use uh, under 28 bit blocks, but still two to the power 64, while not being real world, I mean, nobody's gonna nobody's script that amount of data uh, with uh, one single key. Uh, still, you cannot claim 128-bit security because this this expression is only 64-bit security. So it's kind of it's kind of something annoying. We would like to claim 128-bit of security, but it does not allow us because we know that the security breaks down. So that's the second problem of block cipher-based crypto. The third problem is a bit more subtle. Actually, if you build a block cipher, uh, typically the requirement is that the inverse block cipher is efficient because you would take a cipher text and encrypt to the plain text, and then later at Bob end, you would decipher from the cipher, cipher text back to the plain text. So you need the inverse of the block cipher to be efficient. But if you look at modern modes, they don't use it. They don't use it. 
the modern modes don't make use of the inverse of the block size. So it's kind of, and that costs a lot of uh, efficiency in the block cycle to make it the inverse efficient. The other thing is uh, that you actually try to build a block cipher that looks like a random permutation, uh, SPRP, yeah? pseudo random permutation. But what we actually need in these modern modes is not pseudo random permutation, but pseudo random function. So a function that is not necessarily invertible. Yeah? So if you got here, uh, yeah, yeah, pseudo random permutation is something that you can invert. invert. Pseudo random function, not necessarily. So that's what we really need. But the cipher, if I do that, it does this. So it's kind of the wrong goal. And of course, the fact that the block cipher has fixed length makes the modes rather complex. I already said that in the first point. So block cipher with a fixed key that is PRP is probably not the best thing to do. And that's why we try to do it differently. So how do we do it with permutation-based cryptography? Well, we, have, we don't have a two-layer approach. We have a three-layer approach. First, we first the permutation, cryptographic permutation. Yeah, I will try to explain at the end of the slides how we do that. And it's not we're gonna not gonna use this permutation per se. We're gonna build from this permutation another type of function that I denote here by fk, a new kind of primitive on top of it. And that will be the DAC function. Yeah. Um, it takes arbitrary length input and output. So FK is not like a block cipher, take a fixed length input and fixed length output. It takes arbitrary length input and output. So the output also doesn't have the same length as the input, not necessarily. It can be, but it doesn't have to. And this FK should be hard to distinguish from a random function, or it's actually called a random oracle. A random oracle is a function that takes input of input arbitrary length and generates an output of arbitrary length. And this FK should have a small distinguishing advantage. Now we have an adversary that tried to distinguish FK with a, with a, a key that is unknown and fixed, a random key, uniformly chosen, and a random oracle, and should try to distinguish. And it should have a small distinguishing advantage. Same as for a block size, but then we try to we compare it to something else. And again, we cannot prove this. So it's again based on public scrutiny. So this FK will be the subject of public scrutiny of uh, cryptographers trying to break it, break it, people doing PhDs or professors trying to break it and not succeeding, hopefully. And then we build a mode of a random oracle. Random. So we assume we have a random oracle and we build a mode and then we can easily prove a bound. And these proofs are actually much simpler than the proofs built on a block side, block side because a random oracle is such a powerful thing. And then the security of the mode, instantiated with this, is again the sum of these two terms. So you see it's actually the same as block cipher, blocks that we will replace the block cipher by this primitive deck function, and deck function we build using permutation. But we don't, we don't have to build it using permutation, but that's, in our opinion, the most efficient way to do it. And so we replace the block cipher as the center point of the focus point of symmetric crypto by this deck function, and we think that the best way to build it is with permutations. Okay, so that's, let's see where I am in my timing here. Yeah. I'm already half an hour underway. Okay, so how do we build, no, what can we do with DAC function? And how, what is the exact definition of a DAC function? Well, um, a DAC, DAC stands for doubly extendable cryptographic key function. And this is the thing here. And it takes as argument, not a single string, but a sequence of strings. And so what's the difference between a single string and a sequence of strings? Well, um, if we here have here say one, 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 and the second message would be one, zero, that's not the same as one, one, one followed by zero. So the limits between the messages, the, between the strings are also all coded. And that's very handy aspect to, to use in the definition of mode. So we take as input a sequence of strings. And there's no limit to the number of strings we can put in here. And there's also no limit to the length of individual strings we can input. Um, so the output is potentially infinite, uh, and it's supposedly a pseudo-random function of the input. So that's to say it's hard to distinguish from a random oracle. And what this notation means is we don't have here an input stating the length of the output, but we actually always use this 
in the notation, we always use this in combination with something else. So here we have O n. This is a string of n zeros. That means we take here n output bits yeah? and we add them bitwise. And we take the first n out n bits of the output sequence, unless we have this. And this means we don't take the first n bits, but we take the bits, the n bits starting from offset to offset. That's just notational. I'm explaining notation. It's not so important. Um, and it should be efficiently incremental. So um, first of all, extendable extend put. So if you have computed fk of x, then you can actually compute fk of k y following x, and so this is the after sign, y after x, you can compute this with a cost independent of x. So this means you can keep state. Right? So once you compute this, you keep state, and then you continue by absorbing more. And also extendable output, if you have requested n1 bits from offset 0, and you request then n2 bits from offset n1, this cost is independent of n1. So you keep state both in input and output, in input uh, absorbing and in output extraction. Is it still here? I think people are still following. That's a good sign. Okay, so what can we do with this? Well, I give some, some easy, easy things you can do with it. You can use it as a stream cipher. So uh, what is a stream cipher? Well, a stream cipher generates from a short key and a short diversifier, a nonce. It generates an uh, arbitrary length key stream. And you can actually, this is the DAC function. Right? So you feed it with a nonce. And you have here a plain text, let's say you have one megabyte, you just generate one megabyte one of key stream, you add it bitwise, and you got your cipher text. And you can note it like this. It's very simple. You can also compute a, a tag or a Mac. Yeah? Uh, so a Mac function. And that can that you feed to the function the plain text and you uh, uh, the output as tag. Because a tag is a tag indistinguishable from a random oracle. Uh, this this is completely unpredictable. And that's then presented like this. So this means a tag of t bits coming computed over the message p. And you can do all kinds of things with it. So you can see already if you can compute a tag and you can do encryption, you can combine both to do authenticated encryption. But I have a more complicated example here: a session supporting uh, authenticated encryption scheme. Uh, something we presented a long time ago, 2018. So this line is actually uh, what Alice wants to send to Bob. So this is actually uh, the, the, the key and uh, the, the nonce, the diversifier. And then uh, Alice wants to send to Bob a first message consisting of associated data one, P1, second message associated data, data two, P2, and so on. And forget about this for a while. Um, so how do we encrypt crypt one to C1? Well, we just absorb everything that up to this point. Yeah? So the, the key, the nonce, and associate the data of the first block. And uh, we use the output as key stream to encrypt and key to C1. So if P is uh, one kilobyte, we generate here uh, one kilobyte of output and we add it to P and that's it. That's, yeah? <laughs> and then we compute the tag by additionally absorbing P1. So, so T1 is computed over all of this. Yeah? And then we repeat it. So we absorb then again a N2. That gives us the key stream to encrypt P2 into C2, and then we absorb P2. Then then we get the, the, the output of the DAC function to that is T2, and so on and so on. You can also, instead of absorbing P1, you can absorb C1. Uh, that would give similar similar effect. So when every time you absorb something, all that you absorb before still remains in the state. Right? So this last tag is actually uh, the the DAC function applied to everything. Everything you don't have to again, absorb everything because you did it in steps. Okay, that's kind of the idea. This is the, the formal description of this. Um, you have other things you can do. So instead of uh, building a block cipher that is fixed length, we can make uh, a tweak, uh, a wide block cipher. And a wide block cipher is something that adapts its width to the plain text. So if you have, for instance, a plain text of one megabyte, you can actually here uh, split the megabyte into blocks and you apply this four round, four round structure and you get a cryptogram of one megabyte. Yeah. Um, if you have plain text and associated data, you can put the associated data here. 
And so basically what you do is you apply uh, a deck function to the left part, add it to the right part, then apply a deck function to the right part and add it to the left part. And this in four stages. And it's actually, this has been proven secure uh, in a paper by one of our students and was published in 2019. So this is not authenticated encryption. This is just encryption. But you can easily you can convert it into authenticated encryption by uh, including redundancy in the plain text. Eh? So you take here a plain text. If you want um, 128 bits of security, you append 128 bit zeros. Then you encrypt it using this structure on the previous slide. So as a wide block cipher. And that can be done for any plain text length. Well, not too short. But if it's above a certain length, it's secure. Um, you can have associated data, and this is an E, and that gives you a cryptogram. So if Bob receives this cryptogram, Bob will do the same operation, will do the inverse block cipher, um, and will get the recovered plain text. And if this doesn't is not uh, all zero, zero last T bit, 128 bit, this is not a valid plain text. So because Eve is not able to generate ciphertext that will give rise to all zeros here. That's the idea. Now, you can say, ah, but here you need the inverse of the block cipher again. But that's not true because the inverse of this, you can easily see that it just doesn't require inverse functions. You can just, the addition or the subtraction of this, it's the same operation. You just have to run through the steps from bottom to top. Okay, so I hope I. Uh, convince you that you can do with deck functions a lot of interesting things. Uh, actually, what you can do with block cipher, you can also do with deck functions. You can even build a super block cipher with it. So, how do we build deck functions? Okay, so okay. where it came from, all this work came uh, actually from our preparatory work for the Shatri. Um, at some point, we came up with a structure called Sponge that we actually wanted to use to describe security proper properties. It would remain uh, theoretical, um, but uh, we were in a kind of a dead end with our then design, and we decided to use this structure for our Chatri proposal, and that was Ketchup. Um, and this is the structure. So, what you do in Sponge? Sponge is actually an uh, uh, structure meant for hash or hash, where there is no key. Um, and we would make use of a permutation. So this is a permutation, a cryptographic permutation um, with no key. So that's a public, uh, publicly specified permutation. And we would iterate this permutation to absorb an input of variable length, and then iterate some more to extract or to squeeze an output of arbitrary length. And how it works is that we have a state here, a B bit state, so it's typically B, so in the case of Ketchuk, it's 1600 bits. And we would split it in two parts, a capacity, uh, inner part where the number of bits is the capacity, and an outer part where the number of bits is R. And the efficiency increases when R in R is, so the, the bigger R is, the more efficient it is, but the bigger C is, the more secure it is. And how does it work? Well, you split the input, you have to pad the input in an invertible way, and then you split it into blocks of size R. So if R is 1024 bits, these are four 1024 bit blocks. And you add just the first block to the state. So in this case, it's added to zero. So it's just put there. You apply the limitation, and then you add the second block to the outer state. You apply the permutation again, and so on. And at this point, this whole state depends in a complicated way of all the bits of the input. That's the idea. And F has been designed to make that as complicated as okay. yeah. uh, And then we switch to squeezing phase, where we uh, uh, squeeze uh, 1024 bits at a time. So if we, we need, for instance, 2500 bits, we squeeze the first 1024 bits, we apply F, we squeeze the next 1024 bits, so that's always the same R here. And then if we want more bits, we do F again, and we squeeze the last 500 bits. Yeah. And if you need a million bits, you just have to iterate many, many times. 
Okay, so yeah, am I explaining this because there is no key? Well, you can actually turn this into something close to a deck function by adding a key. So by in the input encoding a key and then the other remain of the inputs, and you got a key function. Um, it's close to a deck function, but not quite because once you have absorbed, you have to go to squeezing and you cannot go back. This is a one time transition, so you can actually not take input, then squeeze, and then go and back to squeeze and absorbing more input. But after looking at it more closely, it turns out that the security of this is equivalent to the security of this. You can actually show that uh, there are, for each, each output, you can find uh, a sponge instance that has this input. That it's just equivalent. It's another representation of the previous. But this is already so refined to have a key. So we, we, in this construction, we initialize our state to a key, to an initial value that's typically a part of the diversifier. Uh, then we apply our function f. And then after each after application of our uh, permutation f, we can squeeze z bits. Uh, so again, the rate. And we can absorb as many bits as the state is wide. It turns out we don't have this restriction to often be absorb in the top part. Huh? This, this restriction that we can only absorb here, we can actually absorb up over the whole width. And that was actually proven by Manik, uh, Anita Bar and Vizar, that this is secure. Um, so now we got actually something close to a DAC function. We have output, input, output, input. But it's not completely true because uh, the, the length of input strings is limited to at most B, in case of Kachak F is uh, 1600 bits, and the length of output is limited to 1024 in that case. So it's not arbitrary length, but that can be dealt with, dealt with just a simple encoding layer on top. You can actually connect with that, and then it's really a DAC function as I formally defined it. Um, this is somebody used not in the field but is used in proposals so the first to use this uh, extensively was mike hamburg in uh, nine, 2017 in stroke framework and later uh, two nist lightweight competition uh, proposals uh, that make use of it are, are proposals zoodies against subterranean but there are actually um, several i think at least six or so proposals in the nist lightweight competition that make use of this so it's not being used in the field, but it's being, it's coming. Okay. Uh, so yeah, how secure is this? Well, actually this is based on cryptanalysis. Now these, these proofs, they assume you have a random permutation, but in practice the permutation is, is fixed, fixed. The permutation has been published and is not random because anything that is published and specified cannot be random. So what is the security of this? Well, it's just based on cryptanalysis. People trying to break. And what they typically do is they plug in a permutation with a reduced number of rounds. So F has 24 rounds. They've tried with two, three, four rounds, five, and see how far they can break it. That's how, how it works. Okay, so this is nice. At least I think this is nice. But um, the problem is that it's very serial. You cannot compute this f, f before you have computed this f. Because this output is only available after you computed this f. So in this f, you can only compute after this f. So it's inherently serial. You can maybe compute f in a parallel way, but the f's individually, they're inherently serial. And that was a, we consider that as a problem. And then we started to look into ways of uh, doing more parallel. Get for the name we got our inspiration from nature. Does anybody speak Italian here? Yeah. What is this in Italian? Nobody? Yeah, yeah. Well, and you don't have to be an Italian to know what this is. Huh? So it's more. It also looks like this because this is the structure. So you see that it's quite. Uh, it was not far fetched. Huh? I see that uh, Martin has, for the occasion, uh, is wearing a farfalle. <laughs> it's very nice. Like, 
Yeah, it was no. Yeah, no. We were thinking, and what, what is it in that? And then we asked Guido, "What is uh, what is butterfly in Italian?" Butterfly, he said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, one of those funny moments. Yeah, yeah. And this was the was an early attempt. I'm not going to not go into uh, detail why it is what it is, but I, I want I show you this uh, to show that it's it's uh, things can evolve. Evolve. So we thought, yeah. After uh, some uh, brainstorming, we thought this would be a good thing. So this actually really realizes parallelizability. Because these Fs, Fs, these are permutation calls, they can be done in parallel. As soon as your message blocks are available, then uh, you can actually add them to the key. The key is added here to this block. You can do this in parallel. And once you have, have then uh, the output of each of these Fs is simply added into a so-called accumulator. And then this accumulator is used for the key stream generation by just taking the value of the accumulator, cutting it off, it off and writing here a zero, one, two. It's kind of a counter mode. For those of you who know counter mode, it's kind of a counter mode. And then you apply again the permutation, which mixes everything together. You add the key again and you get output. And you can here also generate these outputs in a completely parallel way. What you cannot do is parallelize this and this. And so this, this has to anyway come after this, but this was a, for us a good compromise. So this was also not completely new. Uh, those of you who know block cipher modes recognize here PMAC, which actually goes back to a design by Dan Bernstein, protect the countersums. But difference with PMAC and protect the countersums is that here we don't put a pseudo random permutation, which is basically a block cipher, but we just put a permutation. And we put the permutation kind of a bit stretched. So we put Ketchak P, 1600, so the, the thing underlying Chatri, with few rounds, let's say six rounds. And I think we begin four rounds would be sufficient, but that was a bit um, yeah, naive of us, but six rounds. That's four times less than in hashing. Yeah, but uh, then uh, we, we soon noticed that this wouldn't work because there's lots of weaknesses. And we under, underwent through a number of changes and to finally end up with this. And I say the final construction, this, will be, this is indeed the final construction of Farfalle, but I would say this is not the final way to do this kind of work because we think we can do things in a more clean and efficient way. Uh, but we will not call it Farfalle anymore. This is just to say this is work in progress. Right? So this is not the ultimate design, but this is, you could say, uh, this as a kind of intermediate design. So it looks a lot more complicated, but instead of F, you have this PBPC, PDPE. But this is just typically to accommodate permutation with different number of rounds. So here, the number of rounds will be different than here, than here, and then here. Um, you see also these things, these blue blocks. These are actually what we call rolling functions. Huh? So we take the user key that can have arbitrary length. Well, not arbitrary, but length between uh, zero bits width and the, the block size. So this is so this in hundred bits. This key can be up to fifteen hundred uh, ninety-nine bits. And from that, you you generate a secret mask. So this is an integral key. If you know block ciphers, you can see this as a round key. And this key evolves. So you add the key as such to the first message. Then you do a rolling, so a kind of linear feedback shift register-like rolling, a lightweight function. And then you add this rolled key, uh, rolled mask to the second block, and so on and so on. So in between blocks, this is rolled. So this rolling is not, not uh, parallelizable. It's kind of serial inherently, but it's very light. And you can also pre-compute it for different messages. So you see that this is independent of the message. But the rest is the same, except we have this. That was due to a devastating attack that uh, Gilles found. Um, and here we have also a rolling function. This rolling function was initially uh, 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 linear, also a linear feedback shift register. But after another devastating attack, um, after we published it on uh, ePrint, uh, we uh, put it, made it into a nonlinear rolling function. So to say that uh, actually cryptanalysis can break something, but if you are into cryptanalysis soon enough, you can always adapt your scheme before publishing. 
So this has not been broken yet in our implementations and the things we propose, you never know, of course. So I give here some explanation on why things will change. Okay, this is all very abstract because we don't specify the permutation. Uh, so um, let's have a look in the last slides about a concrete permutation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we build a permutation called Zuru. Um, yeah, we kind of uh, made this mythical animal, but there's a picture I actually took uh, of an animal that was standing next to the road. And, and, um, and Zudu is inspired by another work of other people, other authors, namely Gimli. And Gimli is a 384-bit permutation designed by all these people. So it's a team uh, with, among other, uh, Dan Bernstein. And it is very well thought out. It has um, a size that is much smaller than Ketchak F. Ketchak F is 1600 bits. It's only 48 bytes or 384 bits. And you can actually split the state in 12 words of 32 bits. And that's very well, very well suited for low-end CPUs. So now the, one of the most popular low-end CPUs are the ARM Cortex M3 M4. And it has 16 registers of which you can, I think, 14 freely use. And this fits in 12 of these registers. So you can operate with the state completely in register. And on high-end CPUs, you can use SIMD instructions. So these are these massively parallel instructions. But the problem of this permutation, it is not suited for fault falling uh, because it has a large number of rounds and you cannot, uh, without being punished by attacks, uh, reduce the number of rounds easily. So we decided to make our own version of Gimli which is also 384-bit permutation, and you can describe it as the Ketchak philosophy ported to the shape of Gimli. Um, and the, we designed it actually to be used in Farfalle. Yeah, and that's then called Zoof. But this Zoof is supposed to have some speed. So Zoof, yeah. that's, that was the... <laughs> we always think a bit about the names we gave because uh, it's kind of good marketing. Yeah? And in, it inherits actually a lot of the properties of Gimli, but it's, it's, uh, you don't need that many rounds. So we replace actually each of these PE, PD, and so on by F, and just six round uh, Zulu. And here we have an LFSR, here we have an LFSR. And we make this, this bound, this PRF bound. So the, the, the advantage of distinguishing this thing with the loaded with a secret key from a, a random oracle is this. And then let me explain it a bit, what this means. Mean. So um, this term stands for exhaustive key search. Huh? So if you have a k-bit key, let's say it's a 64-bit key, huh, because this key is arbitrary length, uh, well, no, variable length. If you have a 64-bit key, then you will have here n to divided by 2 to the power 64. So that means that if you tried, for instance, 2 to the power 32 keys, then the probability that you found the right key is 2 to the power 32 divided by 2 to the power 64, because you have done that fraction of the key. And this term can become bigger, it can become smaller if you take the key longer. So the smaller, the better. So if you make a longer key, this you can make this smaller, smaller, but not smaller than this, because if this k gets bigger than 192, if you take a key longer than 192 bits, then this term becomes dominant. Yeah? So you can increase the security against exhaustive keys up to 192 bits, but not higher. higher. Yeah? We assume, we, we fear that there are attacks that can do better than exhaustive search as soon as you take the key longer than 192 bits. And then we get another term, that's kind of the, the, the term that accounts for collisions here. We think that uh, getting a collision here is uh, uh, is not easier than this. this. So this means if you if you would be able to do two to the power 128 queries, well then we we fear that it's easy to get a collision here. But below that, we we believe it follows this. This is just a claim. This is not proven. Proven. But this is kind of the idea. So this is what the claims look like. Uh, well, cryptanalysis. No attack yet, but it's ongoing, and it's only published uh, three, four years ago, so you cannot really trust it, but it looks good up to now. Okay, so why is this interesting? Well, let's take a look at performance. And let's take a look at uh, the ARM Cortex M0, even smaller than M3 and M4, with fewer registers and fewer instructions. 
And we compare to AES-128 in counter mode. That's kind of the standard. Everybody is convinced that this is secure, including me, of course. Um, um, and you see that to uh, generate one byte of uh, output in this mode, you have to do you have to run through 121 cycles, more or less. Well, to do the same with Zoof, for long output is 25 cycles. So it's uh, uh, more efficient. Also, for to um, compute a computer to absorb input is 26 cycles. So you see, it's kind of a factor of four to five. Uh, more efficient on this CPU. If you take a look at M3, you see the same ratio. It becomes four times more efficient, but also so AES becomes four times more efficient, but also uh, Zoo. So it's kind of very competitive on that platform. But of course, you cannot just compare it because AES has all this public scrutiny for over 20 years, but Zoof also accumulates. Okay, so let's take a look at more high-end CPU. Uh, Intel Core i5, so that's what many of you have in your laptops, at least if you have a kind of an older laptop, uh, a few years old, because this, these are numbers from a few years old. And you see here that actually AES is faster than Zoof. But that's because, because these CPUs, they have an AES instruction. So it's kind of unfair, because we are comparing, yeah, but it's true, we are comparing software, uh, the general, general instructions, with a dedicated AES instruction. Yeah. So if you would have the same support here, it would really be, it would shoot AES out of the water, basically. And you can actually uh, see this evolution. So uh, a few years later, the, a new core came, became available, the Skylake X, and there AES was not improved so much. So it had the same kind of performance, exactly the same performance on our previous, but due to improvements in the SEMD instructions, uh, Zoof got a lot faster and even bypassed AES. Now, I must admit, on more recent Intel cores, again, AES is fast, yeah? but it's kind of keeping pace. But remember that AES has dedicated instructions, which is nice, but um, Zoof beats, in certain cases, AES, even without dedicated instructions. Okay, so I think I'm quite well, almost on time. Yeah? Uh, so I hope yes. Thank you. Uh, isn't it a bit unfair if we are comparing a sequential AS, AS with parallel zoo? No, no. Yeah, it's actually both on a single core. So if you have parallelism, uh, uh, you can use you can apply it in both cases. It's just the throughput you can get per core. That's basically it. Because you can make it as fast as possible by multiple cores and by multiple. Uh, that's the, yeah. No, we try to make it fair, of course, huh? because, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I hope I convince you that uh, if you have a secure DAC function, then you can, you can do a very powerful thing. You can do all these kind of uh, things. Uh, you can build DAC functions from permutations. You don't have to. You can use other building blocks, but we think it's a good thing to build it from permutation. You can make something compact. That's key duplex. You can make something parallel. That's for Fali and successors. And uh, Zudu is uh, a use case, use case uh, a particular uh, implementation that gives a stack function that is at least very competitive. Oh, but of course, time will tell if it is secure. I think that's it. So uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. And now we have time for questions. Oh. No questions? There was one question already, so if you have any other. Actually, uh, I have one question. Yeah. Um, uh, I lost, I missed something. How do you, how do you uh, decrypt? Decrypt. decrypt. So um, maybe you, you talked about that, but, but no, I missed, I missed I that. Actually, I didn't. did a good point. Okay. Thank but you. I have to go back all the way. Okay. Um, yeah, I did talk about it a bit. So here, huh? decryption. Well, Alice computes the key stream from the deck function, yeah, and adds the key stream to the plain text. Bob receives the cipher text, and Bob gets the same nonce. He computes the same deck function, and subtracts this from the cipher text and gets the plain text again. So, uh, and because and this is the XR, addition and subtraction is the same. Yeah. 
So it is similar scheme like in the case of stream ciphers. This is this is a stream cipher. Okay, okay. But okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Examples. Huh? So in this case, so uh, so instance, Alice encrypts. Alice receives this. She uh, applies a deck function to this and generates a key stream to uh, add to P1, giving C1. Then Bob receives this. She uh, he applies the same the deck function to this and he uh, goes back from C1 to P1. P1. So it's in this case, uh, it's different. Uh, Bob starts from this, and you can actually compute from bottom to top. So Alice goes through the algorithm from uh, top to bottom. Bob goes through the algorithm from bottom to top. But it's always this function is always evaluated in the forward direction. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Oh, okay, there is a question. Uh, so I have a question on the parameters of the Zudu. Uh, you said that it is uh, based on permutations. Yeah. And the permutations are transformed on the process architecture. Yes, yes. So I assume that this is very insufficient on this architecture. So is it true that it can be significantly improved by dedicated uh, instructions? Yeah, of course. Um, um, yeah, the, the uh, Ketchak, there are imp uh, dedicated implementations. And I think there's also dedicated instruction on the modern uh, Apple, Apple uh, computer, this Apple M. Apple. It has dedicated instructions for uh, Ketchak. And it's much more efficient. But already with standard, standard software, it can be quite competitive. So in many cases, you don't really need it. I think when do you need a dedicated CPU, a dedicated uh, an IP, for instance, or a dedicated instructions is when you really have specific requirements of very high speed, or uh, for instance, if you have uh, low energy uh, requirements on a battery power device, where you don't cannot afford to do a lot of software running, but you just would have a small IP. But indeed, it gets much more efficient in dedicated hardware. Yes. Okay, other questions? Okay. Like, uh, I would have to look at the paper more closely, but like, if you have a fixed size state, yeah. then encrypting like multiple small messages yeah. is more secure than encrypting one large message. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> what it is, uh, so in this thing, I can give you an example make the use case. Let's say, assume you have two small slices and you need a big file to go from one end to the other. Then you can send the file in small chunks. So you send a small chunk. You send it to the receiving device. The device uh, decrypts the chunk and authenticates it. If it's okay, it writes it in non-volatile memory. And so on and so on. So you can actually do incremental. If you do that with a long file, let's say uh, one megabyte, huh? then you send the whole megabyte. You have to store this megabyte in RAM that you probably don't have. And then after receiving the, after verifying the tag, you can start writing it. Well, uh, in this approach, you can have these incremental tags every kilobyte or so, and you can then uh, uh, write it block by block. And that's an advantage. And that's also more secure. Well, that's more robust, huh? but let's, let's say that the power goes down halfway then you can uh, retake. In the first case, you can, in the case of incremental blocks, you can continue later when power goes up again or when the connection, connection drops, for instance. But if you have one long communication with a single tag, that's, that's not so robust. Huh? If your communication goes away or something, then, then yeah, where are you? But I don't know if short messages, I think is a good point to investigate, but whether long, many short messages is uh, more secure from a cryptanalytic point of view than one long message. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what's the uh, code size compared to AES? Because some microcontrollers have AES built in as a yeah. peripheral uh, and some don't. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very small code size. So Zudu has a very small code size. It's a very simple yeah. round function. But of course, there are some, some compromises. So if you do a very compact code, code uh, then uh, it comes, becomes a bit slower. 
if you unroll unload, so if you remove all loops, uh, then it becomes much faster. So you can unroll six rounds, it becomes faster, but the code is three, six times bigger. Uh, if you have uh, if you have uh, the for loop, then it, it's uh, somewhat uh, a little bit slower, but it's much more compact, of course. But of course, with the with the for loop, you must take take care of uh, speculative execution and all that kind of stuff. Of course, huh? yeah. Hello, I have two questions. For first one, if I understand well, Farpala has no, no scheduling. This means he has been generating on the uh, beginning. beginning. Yeah, so I can show the demos. Yeah. So the key here, uh, it can be defined by LS by up, and it can have uh, any length uh, with the maximum. It cannot be occupying after padding more than one block. So, um, and it's actually shared yeah? so and this key is the shared key but you can actually if as long as you keep this key you can see you do this and then you can throw away the key if you like yes because uh, this is a similar question to uh, this colleague to ask because uh, i think about limitation of that uh, amount of entropy which coming in our, yeah, our yeah. Yeah, the entropy, but so for instance, in, in Zoof, this has 384 bits, and this can have up to 382 bits. Um, yeah, that's of course, we don't make any claims be above 192 uh, bits, but you can use up to 382 bits. But we don't make claims, but it cannot hurt, you see. So yeah, we feel that this limitation of entropy is not a problem. But yeah, of course, it's up to cryptanalysis to, to show that it is a problem or not. Okay, and the second one, uh, in situation that this kind of algorithm will be used for authenticating encryption, yeah. will have better properties than uh, known issue regards polynomial, uh, algorithm writes uh, G hash or for 1305. Yeah. Um, so indeed. So this this phase here, um, the absorbing top or the uh, the contraction phase or what do you call it, the first phase, there you basically uh, compress into 384 bits. And G hash indeed that does something similar. I think G hash compresses into 128 bits, but you also have 41305 that are similar functions. And um, yeah, if I'm honest, on many, many views, these will be fast. Not on Cortex M3 and 4, I think, but I think many CPUs, these will be fast. Um, but they are faster because you got dedicated instructions. So if you look at a multiplier, that's quite a complex uh, instruction, and it's there um, yeah, to do a multiplication. So it's kind of you make use of the certain instructions that are um, do a complicated uh, operation. Um, yeah, how should I say? It's like ARX. So using addition and uh, uh, addition and XOR. So uh, our idea is well, once this get this, when this would get popular. Huh? you would see dedicated instructions appear. And then you, you would be get faster again than things like G hash of 41305 on many CPUs. Because these things are dedicated, our designs are really solely for hardware. It's basically the long-term vision is that it should be for hardware. For AES, this was never the case. AES is really software oriented. We never thought about hardware, but now the irony is that AES we see in hardware. Well, this not yet. Okay, and that was the last question. We have to finish now, so thank you again. Thank you.